Hi, I'm Naomi Siemens, a poet and translator based in Manhattan. And today I'm going to read to you from my translation from the Old English of the Seafarer, which I worked on while in residency at Barrack Pond Tweed on the North Sea, and where I had the great privilege of meeting my now friend and ongoing collaborator, the artist Morag Eaton. The Seafarer. I can be honest about myself, tell the true tale of my travels, how I often struggled through some troublesome times, and for a weary while had to put up with an acrid ache, a weight on my chest. I got to know the terrible cross-trenching of the waves on a ship, those houses of sorrow, where I was often caught in a claustrophobic night watch crushed up against cliffs, my feet cinched with cold, fettered by frost. Despite those cold clamps, anxiety seethed hot around my heart, and inner hunger rent my sea-weary spirit. The lucky landsman doesn't understand how I, miserable and sad, would withstand the cold sea ice in winter, the exile tracks without loved ones. I was hung with frost crystals. Pelting hail flew. I could hear nothing but the roar of the sea, the ice cold wave. Sometimes for fun, I would imagine the song of the swan, the gannet's noise, and the curlew's voice, and pretend they were people laughing. The singing seagull was my drinking buddy. Storms beat stone cliffs. The icy feathered tern would talk to herself. Very often, the eagle cried out at that, dew on her feathers. But not one of those fellow shelter seekers could soothe my destitute soul. These things mean nothing to the city dweller who, in the prime of life, proud and drunk, spares no thought for this baleful business or how someone like me might survive in the seaways. Night's shadows darken. It snows from the north. Frost freezes the land. Hail, that coldest of kernels, falls to the earth. All my heart's hesitations are churning. Now that I have come to know the towering trenches, the tumult of the salt waves. A deep desire constantly moves my body on so that I might seek out strange lands. Even so, there is not a soul on earth so proud, so good with gifts, so bold in youth, so brave indeed, so dear to their Lord, that whatever they are set off to do, they have no fear in seafaring. Even so, the seafarer doesn't need things like harp singing or ring giving or someone to warm the bed, all the world's comforts, anything else except the rolling of the waves. Someone who struggles at sea has a longing. The woods begin to blossom. The mulberry tree becomes beautiful. The fields fair, the world hurries on. All of these things move the mind, the eager spirit to travel, move the one who thinks like this to travel far on the flooded paths of the sea. Just as the mournful language of the cuckoo, summer's ward singing, forebodes a horde of bitter sorrows building up in the body, a person, a prosperous warrior, doesn't understand what those of us endure who follow far and wide the ship tracks of other outcasts. Listen. Now my spirit is spiraling out from my chest. My imagination is taking flight amidst enormous waves. It soars over the whale's home to the corners of the earth. It comes back to me eager and greedy. The lone flyer screams, egging the untamed heart onto the whale road across the surface of the sea. For me, the seduction of the sea burns hotter than this dead life, fleeting on firm ground. 
I don't believe the Earth's wealth will always remain for a body. One of three things will always call it in question before the time comes. Disease, old age, the sword. They tear the life out of those doomed to die. The praise of the living to the ones who remain is the best last word. For everyone must work up a little worldly glory before they move on their way. A little glory on earth from the fending off the enmity of fiends. Brave deeds against a couple of devils so that people will praise them afterwards and that they might share a little fame with the angels always. There's glory in that lasting life. Joy with such a host of heroes. But the glory days of Earth's kingdom are over. There are no kings now, no Caesars, no gold givers, as in the ancient days when people performed mighty deeds and lived with most lordly authority. That whole company of heroes has disappeared. Those kinds of joys are gone. Now, weak men hold the world's wealth, live by other sweat. Glory is gone. The nobility of the earth ages and withers, as now every person throughout the earth ages and withers. Old age comes to them, faces pale and hoary heads mourn old friends. The kin of kings have been given over to the grave. When life leaves you, that flesh you called home can no longer taste sweetness, feel pain, lift its hand, or make its mind work. You want to strew grave gold for your family. You want to bury treasure with your siblings' bones, but it's of no use to them. Gold is enabled to save a soul steeped in sin when faced with the fear of the gods, even if they still walk the earth. Mighty is the terror of the measurer from whom the world turns. She has fixed firm the land, all the corners of the earth and the high heavens. Someone who doesn't fear their ruler is a fool. They are undone by death. The one who lives lightly on this earth is fortunate. Help comes down from the heavens. The measure makes their minds strong because she believes in their strength. Person must navigate their unruly ideas, hold them in check, be trustworthy to others, keep their wits about them. One must moderate love for friends with the hatred held for enemies, though you want to fill someone full of fire or build the biggest pyre to celebrate a friend. Fate is stronger, the measure mightier than anyone's plans. Let's consider where our home could be, then think about how we might get there. And let us also act in order to be back where we belong, the high heavens of Our Lady's love. Let there be thanks to the Holy One for this, because she found us worthy. Ancient glory, unending ruler, forever. So be it. I'm Maura Gayton, printmaker, resident in Berwick-upon-Tweed in England, where my partner Dave Watson and I run Forge Yard Gallery. I met Nomi Siemens in 2018 through the artist Todd Hansen, and Nomi and I have so far collaborated on three projects. Ephemeris, Nomi's new translation of the first horoscope in English from the 16th century almanac, The Shepherd's Calendar already printed as a concertina book. Under production is a second concertina book, All at Sea, with her translations of The Whale and The Seafarer from the Anglo-Saxon Book of Exeter with artwork from myself and Dave Watson. What you're seeing in this film is a quick basic introduction to my working method for our third collaboration, The Wife's Lament from the Book of Exeter. The image I'm working with interprets the phrase, makes plans to murder. The technique I'm using is monoprint, where ink is laid out on a glass plate and then removed to create the image. The nature of the brush marks on the glass forms an element of the image. 
monoprinting is as close as you can get to painting and printmaking. You can see I'm using a variety of techniques to remove the ink. I use vegetable based inks from Hawthorne Printmakers in York, England and I print onto Awagami Japanese paper. Traditionally, the Japanese use a flat handheld device called a baron to transfer the image to the paper. I prefer the end of a large metal spoon because the pressure can be applied more specifically. To apply pressure to a larger area, I use the smooth edge of a mobile phone. Two colours are applied separately to the image. Colours set the mood. Here I wanted an atmosphere of dank and cold to hint at one interpretation from the text about the king. To create the finished image, additional details are added. I describe the work I make as interpretation rather than illustration. The best illustration should take the viewer's imagination to somewhere beyond the words on the page, hence interpretation. The ambiguous nature of the wife's lament offers me many different visual possibilities. Some of the images will go on to have hand stitching applied once the ink is fully dried. 